And uh, I, I guess I, my, my question was like, I know that there's um, like currently we use BFT time and I haven't read the, the spec uh, for PBTS, but I'm wondering how, how are they different really? And uh, are you going to uh, deprecate BFT time? Yep, we'll get would, to that. I would propose Daniel to tackle the first part of the question and I could tackle the second. Or Daniel could actually tackle both. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, so, thank uh, you. Yeah, the main difference between PBTS and the, the current method we use, that PBTS will ensure that there is a relation with the real time of the block time. Ah. Uh, so the block you. time is produced. So when you produce a block, you timestamp the block, and the other validators have to verify whether the timestamp is good, meaning what whether it has relation with the real time. That's the in general thing. The problem of the other method, BFT time, you took we use it to take the the medium of the timestamp of the pre volts I see. It's like a good way and fault tolerant. If you have more than one third of guys with very bad clocks, we can have timestamps that don't match the real time of production. Please go ahead. I thought we were asking something. Uh, oh, no, no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I need myself. So the second part, I don't know if Sergio, we we are considering initially to enable the both modes of producing timestamps uh, because you need to have that compatibility with with the existing, because for validating a block, you have also to validate the timestamp. So if you just remove the current algorithm, we are not able to validate old blocks. And this can be a problem, but we, yeah, uh, Sergio, go ahead. We, yeah, there, there are two aspects. The first one is is rightly what you said, uh, the fact that since uh, a node might want to synchronize from, from Genesis, you cannot change the validation of the blocks uh, like in, a, in the abstract and that's it and you call it a day because that means that means that the old blocks won't be you know won't be validating against that so somehow the bf time validation not production but validation should be kept even with a coordinated upgrade it should be kept there at least for a, for for the foreseeable future so that existing chains can still you know uh, block sync from uh, an arbitrary height that's the first that, that's the first uh, and so we are thinking like our current thinking even we don't have a, like a concrete design yet because we are uh, for reporting the the work we you know we did in 2022 2021 2022 so we didn't get there yet but we will get eventually uh, by the end of the this month or beginning of the next um so we the, the current at least in our minds the current approach we're going to follow is going to be very similar in a way to the way we enabled vote extensions are you familiar with vote extensions yeah so we're going to be enabling in a in a in a similar way for you know for looking forward which is that we will have a special value, which is like the default one, which means that uh, if uh, a node didn't upgrade yet, so th that, that's basically the value, and that means we still own BF time, BFT time, and then there will be, uh, that value will change, switch to something else. This value should, is supposed to change at the same height everywhere, and that means that from now on, blocks should be validated using the um, PBTS rules. And so, if, so that means that if somebody's, mm, um, block syncing from an arbitrary height, if the height is below the one that marks this parameter, which is common to everyone, it should be using BFT time, not PBTS. So if he gets a block that uh, follows PBTS rules should be incorrect, it, it cannot happen, it's an attack. And if uh, if you are beyond that height for that chain, then uh, then it's the other way around. So only PBTS would, um, PBTS produced um, uh, blocks would would pass validation, uh, BFT time would not pass validation. So that was the first aspect of compatibility. I don't know if you have questions before I go to the second one. So if I understand correctly, that means if if for some reason this clock drift, that's more than a third of the voting power, then you have like people would disagree and like the network yes. would stop making progress, right? Yes, but that that is correct. But that that's independent of uh, upgrading, you know. Up, uh, right. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, this forces this forces validators to be to have like a pretty accurate uh, 
system clock, which uh, via, for instance, NFT, uh, oh, sorry, NTP. I don't yeah, know why I'm yeah. I, yeah, sure, too, long, yeah. too long a break. <laughs> um, via via NTP is uh, reasonable to achieve. So yeah, and I think I remember William, a former member of the team, ran some validations. I th- I don't know if it was on Osmosis or on or on, on the Hub uh, a couple of years ago. You know, when when this work was actually done being done for the first time. And they, I think he realized that out of the 20, 150 validators that uh, were active at the time, there were like two or three. By, by look, he was just basically looking at the um, at the times uh, reported in the blogs. There were like two or three validators that indeed uh, had a very bad time, like um, in error of, of seconds uh, inaccurate. And so those validators, when moving all over to PBTS, would not be able to propose. So their proposals, proposals will be rejected. And they would have to actually to their operators would have to correct that. But they were like uh, two or three. They, there was no it was it was nowhere near the one third threshold. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. In any case, we want to provide some some metrics in order to evaluate that. So, in the case of William, it was exactly the metric he was considering. And my sport, he realized that some validators are very yeah, the unsynchronized clocks. But you are right saying that you have to prepare the network. But the idea, I think, uh, Sergio was. Telling is that you you need a height. You agree on a height, and from this height, you use PBTS. For the validator of the previous blocks, of course, you use BFT type. This is a consensus parameter, so everyone has to agree a priori. Yes, and then the second aspect is that uh, we are unable when we we are an, well, we we are able to do anything, right? It's software, but uh, it, it would be it would be unfair to our current user base. To basically do breaking changes that forces uh, things like hard forks, etc. Et so, as this, uh, as so, there's there's an initiative called soft upgrades that we haven't had the time to tackle in the last one year and a half. And this is the initiative that would allow us to change the block format without forcing a hard fork, which is as as is not done, it is not possible today. What we are probably going to do with the, at this time, at least with the PBTS, is that we won't go the full stretch of PBTS. Uh, we will just include include the logic, but there will be things like, for instance, once you have to be PBTS, the timestamps of the votes become irrelevant. So you could actually remove them from there, uh, and then that would enable do some sort of like, for instance, uh, BLS sing- signing and things like this. So we were we are not gonna leave. We're not gonna do that. We're still gonna keep the timestamps there, even if they are all the same. We're gonna keep the timestamps in the votes so that the block format doesn't change and we don't force existing change to hard for because they upgrade to the to the um, version that will you know be one in principle that that will include pbts so we are we're laying the like the base logic the base you know the base mechanisms so that it's already there but in order to go to the full you know full extent of pbts we cannot uh, at the moment we will need to, uh, to 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 come up with a way uh to change the block format for existing existing chains that don't don't for doesn't force them to 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 hard fork actually that makes sense. Thank you. That's very helpful. Cool. Then, uh, Andy, if you would like to take over, unless there's anything else on PPTS that we would like to cover, there's there's extensive uh, documentation how we plan to do that. It's all broken down here, uh, by the way, everyone. Uh, so unless there's anything else on PPTS, I suggest we do the 23, 2023 December updates, and then we continue with V1 release and the other topics. Yeah, sounds good to me. Cool. Andy? Um, yeah, sure. So yesterday we just uh, released the, the December update. Uh, it was a short month for us. Um, and we usually close from, from Christmas to the New Year's end, but we, we did, um, the team did uh, some work on a few things. Mostly, um, there's some improvements on the on the testing infrastructure, um, E2E tests, uh, some bug fixes, and things like this. Um, there's um, some work on on the storage optimization front, uh, related to uh, like how it saves batches. Uh, this is kind of like um, somewhat related to some work. Uh, that uh, the team is doing, the squad for storage is doing related to uh, to the keys. Um, so we put uh, some uh, references in there if we want to follow up. Um, but mostly, 
there was not like a, a lot of big things happening. Um, but we do want to keep these uh, cadence for updates, like at least monthly uh, on things that the, the teams are working on. And eventually at the end of the quarter, we'll do like a long form of the uh, quarter updates. But this is, um, uh, I think, a good way that we keep you posted um, in a nice way on things that are happening uh, at least monthly from our front. I don't know if anybody has any questions or some of the, bit, uh, the updates, but um, if not, we can just uh, move on to the next topic. Cool. I think we should move on, yeah. Uh, regarding V1 release, I don't think there's much else to say, right? Did you want to cover anything else besides, or in more in more detail, what we're going to do in terms of QA improvements? Or well, it's fine. Uh, no, I think it's it's mostly, I think uh, most of the, the work, um, let's say related to V1 is what we discussed about the PBTS, um, some other things that the, 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 the teams are looking on is it's some of the QA infra and the testing, doing some improvements. I think we um, already discussed that um, we want some of the PBTS uh, work to go first and then we'll, we'll start looking um, on key way um, testing. And, and not only from, from this perspective, but mostly from the bandwidth and the storage front uh, perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, then we have PebbleDB and block sync performance. Uh, Jacob, which one would you like to cover first? I think uh, they're both relevant for you. Okay, I think the best thing to cover would be Pebble. Uh, because actually, I've got to fix my block sync PR, which is 1970. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, Anton made an excellent comment on it. He was like, "I'm not sure what 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 the changes here uh, would do to improve performance." I actually believe that I closed uh, Dave's issue. I also think I may have reverted it. So I'll, I'll take care of that later. And I would like to speak to Pebble for a second or speak of oh, Pebble. Thanks for that. Uh, so uh, would it be possible, Adi, are you controlling the screen? Yes. Cool. Could you, yeah, bingo. Go down to the benchmark results because they have this one freaky thing. Uh, okay, maybe go back up might be in one of the PRs, um, but... This one? Uh, no. Uh, scroll up and then go to the PRs themselves because here's the deal, guys. I made a pretty good benchmark suite. Uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, add PebbleDB again, I think, <laughs> and then scroll to the bottom of that. Uh -huh. Yes, right there. Okay, guys, uh, what I actually hit on is like Go Level DB may be so non performant in situations where there are a lot of keys or the values are large that it's actually kind of a security risk. Now, uh, there's also an issue on uh, the Comet BFTDB repo that, uh, that you know, says, hey, we should tweak Go Level DB. I actually fully agree. I think that we should tweak the hell out of Go Level DB. I think we should tweak the hell out of Pebble DB and then let the benchmarks speak for themselves. My opinion, keeping in mind that, like, this opinion worked out for the Cosmos SDK, right? But hmm. Tendermint does not store things the same way, or Comet, Tendermint, whatever, excuse me for using the antiquated terms. Um, it doesn't store things the same way that the SDK does, right? Sure. And so we're dealing with sort of a different set of concerns. And even the benchmark could be in the wrong spot, right? I put the benchmark in the DB lib. The benchmark should probably be in Comet BFT. Um, that way, you know, we can try and benchmark how Comet BFT 
is going to perform with different databases as opposed to just looking at raw KV store performance Yes. in the case of this abstraction. Does that make sense? That would be, that would be a lot more valuable, yes. Okay. Would you be cool with my implementing that sometime next week or so? Uh, if you if you do it in a way in which we can understand it and it's not kind of overwhelming us with PRs and issues and uh, stuff, then that would really help. Like even if you do Could it in, in a way you in which you overwhelm. let me know, uh, uh, look, open criticism, open praise, whatever. What helps you to understand, say, benchmarks or anything? Because I'm very happy to do it, however, is most effective. I, I actually believe that this might be exploitable. Hmm. Um, but like, you know, bottom line, I of course, if I'm going to write any code, I, I want it to be useful to you guys. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. And probably the first most useful thing is this baseline. But we don't know what the most typical benchmark should look like. Yes, Mina, please jump in whenever you want. But if we if we close this issue, basically, and we have a strong opinion of what the baseline at the comet layer is, because like you said, the things that you benchmarked here, by the way, I, I I'm reading this saying that actually go level DB is faster. It takes 0 0.008 versus 0 0.1 nanoseconds per operation. And that seems to be the case. So there's an order of magnitude difference. I know. Yes. You now, are correct. You're cor exactly. You're totally right until we reach a certain point and then everything goes to hell for go level DB specifically. And the thing okay. is, like, um, yeah, I can I can fix Pebble so that it's faster than Go or Go level DB at these lower levels. Mm -hmm. but I don't know of a way to fix Go level DB so that it's faster okay. than Pebble as we grow. Yeah. So we could play like a competition where our team takes the side of goal level DB because I think Jasmina is already doing experiments with goal I level would DB. Love and, that. and you can you can champion for Pebble DB and we could uh, have a raffle or whatever this, that's called. This is, well, I, I called it a battle. I actually had two bartenders make the same drink tonight. So I, I, look, I'm in. I love it. Let's do it. So at the uh, moment, what we're trying to do is um, I'm trying to evaluate basically the performance of these different key layouts that we're that we're building on top of Comet with using as little as possible of an overhead from the application, like without adding anything extra that is supposed to take extra time. And then I'm trying to measure basically the, you know, the storage access times based on some metrics that we added into a branch of Comet BFTDB. And um, that it would be great if we had these numbers, for example, for for a different backend. And we're not running currently level go level DB, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll maybe have time to to run it also with Rocks DB. The, the the point of the test is to essentially you know show that we are achieving some benefits in terms of the efficiency of pruning and compaction uh, data, and you know the performance of Comet uh, when there's a different key layout. And if we see such benefits, then we will be happy to come out to the community and tell us, look, guys, we have improved on this and, and it helps uh, to this extent, right? So that is that is the, the benchmarking that we're currently doing. And we did have at the back of like our heads, and it's been a plan for a while to converge to one database backend, but that is going to be very hard until we do really extensive testing. So any benchmarks that you, for example, have of Comet running on top of PebbleDB, uh, either by running our... Um, and to end tests or or anything else is um, definitely valuable, and it should go into a, you know an important insights towards this goal that is eventually going to come. We can't do it now overnight and cut out everything, but it's definitely important that we and also we can have that as a recommendation to our users. So if you want to still use Go Level EB, sure, go ahead. But you know we have also these insights that show some of these. What would also help in terms of benchmarks is to know, you know, is it the default configuration of PebbleDB as it comes, or did you change some parameters, the amount of RAM it's using, or whatever parameters there are? And if you did, then it's good to have this as a, you know, as a whole description of the benchmark, basically, what 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 happened. Yasmina, am I saying your name correctly? Yeah, you are. 
Wonderful. Um, so that was awesome feedback. And let me even add another layer to it and see if this is a concern for the Comet team. Um, the next layer is like application performance, right? Okay, so, and, and by the way, personally, I believe that we may have made an epic mistake by separating TMDB and Cosmos DB. But, but let's leave that for another time, okay? Um, because they're still basically doing the same thing. So now we have two libraries that do more or less the same thing, and that's not great. Anyhow, um, Yasmina, for you and your team, is it more helpful to have like comet only benchmarks or do you want benchmarks where we're working with an ABCI application, say like DYDX? Um, I think as a baseline, uh, it would be good to have um, comet only just so that we are clear on the, at the consensus level, basically only the consensus operations, like saving a block, reading a block, reading the last commit and all of these things. So these are probably application independent and then everything else might be application dependent, like the app store itself, it might need to be tuned, but that will be very hard for us to do. Then that can be a set of recommendations for particular applications users, application users that is, but for us as developing Comet, it's more beneficial to have um, as little overhead from the application as possible so that we can isolate the performance of Comet itself. Like if, um, you know, if saving a, a block or reading some the last commit takes, you know, a substantial amount of time without having the application doing a lot of verification and stuff on top, then, uh, then we need to optimize on our end. We can't tell the app, look, you need to fix this. So we need to understand what's, uh, what's going on there, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, what's your best torture suite? I noticed that recently something called Tendermint load test was renamed Comet load test. Is this like our de facto torture suite to uh, assess database performance and do benchmarking? So this is uh, what we. So we have two two set of uh, two different uh, sets of uh, benchmark. You know, test load generators. One is this um, TM load test generator that or Comet load generator that essentially sends. Um, transactions to comment that are key value store transactions and they shouldn't be coming with a lot of overhead. Then we have our end-to-end -end test app that is a bit more complicated that adds both extensions and additional sanity checks. And that's what we use in our in our QA. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, if you want, I can point you to to the, um, or write it in this share doc at some point, like what, exa what exactly is it that we're running against a running comment node? But what you can, what we do typically, the, the the load generator, you can give it a URL where you're running your comment node, or or testnet or whatever, and then it's going to hammer comment with a uh, with a set of transactions. That is essentially what we also use for our benchmarks. May I give a proposal? Yeah. Um, hey Sergio, if you don't mind, I, I'll just finish up my proposal and let you. Have, okay, cool, cool. Um, my proposal, please merge Pebble. Uh, and a comment BFT DB. That way, what I can actually do is without using a fork, I can begin to do some serious benchmarking. And uh, then you guys can also guide me on, hey, Jacob, that's, that's not serious benchmarking. You're doing it wrong in some way. Um, you know, and, and I'm very happy to get that guidance from you guys because I guess um, my my concern with the KV stores in particular is when we look at that benchmark, go level DB at one point, and just so you know, you can replicate this with values. You can also replicate it with keys. It will just fall off to nowhere. And this is kind of a known issue. And I think that with older chains, so the hub, osmosis, we're likely to see that start to happen, and I don't want it to happen. So, Jacob, are you acquainted? Are you are you acquainted with our QA process, quality assurance process? The process that's that actually that's, that's actually a hard no, sir. Okay, 
Um, Ali, uh, Ali, Adi, uh, do you do you mind going to to the reports in in say yeah I think it's in Docs Docs QA. Just click on Docs then QA. Yeah, uh, can you can you go up up one one level? Just take the directory. No, uh, QA. Yeah, there you are. So this is uh, this is present in the in the docs folder in uh, in our code base. We have started doing this when we had to retract O35 and O36. This was a way, an effort, right, that we did consciously to try to restore the confidence of the user base on tendermint slash comet. At the time, it was still tendermint, and this is what we put together in like the time we had available. Of course, there are things here we're not testing because there are many variables. So we decided just to choose a few ones and do this. The main idea of this is that we are going to put comets and there are a lot of stress. In particular, there's one test case that we actually spawn 200 nodes of which 175 are validators and we slam it with different uh, workloads, controlled workloads. That's why we use TM load test, by the way. That's, the, that's where the TM load test piece fits. Okay? On what schedule does that happen? Uh, we we run this for every release once it's code frozen. So when you are okay, picking up um, a release, when you are picking up a release that is not an alpha release and not an, a release candidate, but is the final release, you have the guarantee that we have run these things on the thing you are running on your on your node. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, I just upgraded my computer from a sixteen gig MacBook to a sixty four gig MacBook. The difference was insane. I'm just curious what the requirements are to actually run this test suite. Yeah, so you need 200 nodes and it, it needs to be a real, realistic network because we're measuring performance as well. We're not only measuring that it doesn't break down, we're also me uh, measuring and reporting on performance. So each of the nodes needs to be in an independent, independent virtual machine. And for that, we are using DigitalOcean, okay? And so there is, now there is, there is a- Okay, I, I understand why we didn't remove that then. Yeah. Uh, if, so if, if the uh, yeah, yeah. So the there is in in that directory. So my suggestion to you, in case it's useful for you, is that please go through not only the reports. We have a report for O34, a report for O37, and a report a report for O38. And the one for one zero should be coming this quarter once uh, it's code complete and code frozen, which is not the case yet. Even if we have an alpha out, uh, there is also files there that explain the method. We did our best at describing what we did for those tests and for producing the reports so that anyone could do it. So there is, there is a special file there called method. This is the way you should be doing it, all, uh, both for running the tests and also for reporting. Can you, can you um, um, uh, Adi, can, can you quickly go to, the, to one of the reports just to, to give him an idea of what they look like? So what they look like is this, this is the report. So, okay, there's some text here. I, I, I don't want to take a long, a long time. I think the most interesting part is the, the um, Prometheus slash Grafana part, which is scrolling down. So here you see, so here we actually show graphs of, for instance, the mempool size, the number of transactions, et cetera, and we compare it. So the idea here is to tell you, hey, we run this, the same test we run for the previous release, we are running it for the current one and the, 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 and the, the um, the performance does not degrade. So we, we're not screwing up performance in the new functionality that we are shipping this time. This is the main message here. So I am sure that Jasmina has more advanced tests. That's I think what she was talking about before in the particular case of storage, but uh, the lack of like agreement or, or, or coordination on, on which tests to run, you know, for what you wanna do, what I would advise you to do is if you are able to produce, you don't need to do the report because that takes a long time, but if you come up with the graphs that show us that running this QA improves some of those metrics, the latency, the number of transactions per second, the whatever it is, using Pebble, for instance, that would be a strong, a strong indication that we should actually be adopting it. Because this is the best we have. I mean, the, the, the SDK and other apps have other things, but this at, at a comment level, this is the best we have to have an idea of the performance of our system. I know it's not perfect, but that's the best we have.
questions, comments? No, it's very good. Like, so basically, if you guys want to champion Go Level DB, okay, and, and tweak it, right? Tweak it like crazy. Or even champion Postgres. There, there was talk about moving this whole thing to Postgres or to SQLite. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm fine with any of these as long as we don't have crazy performance degradation, which mm -hmm. I think Go Level DB does, but maybe, maybe configuration can fix that. So, um, I'll do my damn best with Pebble. <laughs> if you guys find something faster and better, I'll be very happy about it. So <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, I would also like to say that if if there is if evidence in the community that there is, you know, that the people are like our users are are willing to have Pebble as one more database, not the default, but just one more database that you can configure so you don't have to fork in our system. This has not been discussed internally, so I cannot give you a definitive answer. I'm just t t telling you my opinion, not the team's opinion. We would need to discuss this internally. But in principle, in my opinion, like the ultimate goal is to just uh, choose one and, and, and die with it, right? Like the, the ultimate goal of the all the DB thing is why should we ha be having like and maintaining this, uh, you know, TMDB or Comet DB and having all these things and not being able to, you know, to, to bound to one database and then basically get it, you know, get the most of it. This is what we have now. We have an abstraction that prevents us from, you know, getting the best of of, of uh, any particular database. So so the ultimate goal is just to to boil down to, to, to choose one and remove support for the others. But we are not there yet. Until we are there, any suggestions for extending the number of databases supported, I'm, I, I'm not against it because that might be the one, right? So so until we are in a position to to just uh, choose one and remove the others, I think it's a re it's a, a reasonable uh, a reasonable option to to add anyone that and that might look promising. Now I see, I insist this is my opinion. This is a community call. Our team has not discussed this internally, so please take this as just my opinion. Yeah. Also, um, from a storage perspective, um, the team the the storage team maybe just me and I can talk a little bit more about it. Um, there's the fact that we, we can uh, focus on one database, but also uh, in the future, there might be options that we allow uh, people to pass configuration parameters, uh, database configuration parameters. Um, so you, people could tweak the, the underlying database passing like configuration or something like that, right? Because right now it's kind of like the default, uh, but in the future, that might be also a possibility. Yes, exactly. That's something that we are discussing to, um, if we don't make time to choose one, to kind of find a sweet spot where we essentially allow for an API where people could pass on configuration parameters to different databases, and then they can tweak each of the databases without having to fork or to hard code parameters and then, and then recompile with that. Which is something that today is not possible, right? Today, okay. I mean, today we can use one of, if we count Notional's Pebble Fork, I, I think it's one of five databases. Um, and you can compile with any of them. Thing is, three of five do not actually work. So l let me recount the ones I don't think actually work. We got Bolt, don't work. Badger, don't work. Rocks, Rocks works, but it, does not work well enough to like matter when compared to Pebble. Um, I have a a maxim, a provisio. I, I don't know what to call it precisely, but in general, I recommend to teams that we work with that you try not to cross the Seago boundary. Actually, this is inspired by how much better Pebble's performance was when compared with Rox's performance, okay? The only difference between Pebble and Rox, really, is that Pebble is native Go. Rox crosses that Seago boundary and stuff gets weird. So, um, so, so, so I, yeah. I, I think it's, a, a, um, at least in the SDK, it's like we're kind of approaching it in a different, a different way. And um, I, I think the common team is approaching it the right way, just kind of getting a better understanding of like how to best do the key layout um, and 
uh, them better understand it. I, I think like Pebble isn't a end all be all solution. It's fast. Um, it is it is somewhat different design than RocksDB. RocksDB has a lot more features, and it's like you can make RocksDB faster. And I think we like in our benchmarking, like RocksDB, um, like the Seagull boundary, like let's say IVL v two is written with SQLite with like a Seagull boundary, and it's faster than Pebble. Um, and so I, I think the Seagull boundary is like very low these days in Go. So it's like almost like it's not very large. But I, I think overall, I think the the common team is taking the right approach to like first getting a better understanding of the user's um, habits in terms of like archival data and long term data, and then testing it and coming out with the results. Um, I think it's the right approach. I think before Cosmos, we were all just like, oh, like just add DBs when people want it, um, and we added like B trees, and when we had LSM trees, and it's like. Um, when we did an analysis of like what is the right read comparison on like IBL, let's say we actually discovered that it's um, way faster to use a B tree than it is a LSM tree. Um, and so I think co the common team is probably um, doing or has done the same approach, um, same testing, um, or will do. So I, I think it's just like a, a waiting game. I, I'm I don't like on level DB you can make it faster if you want. Just turn off compaction. Um, and then you won't have any of the slowdowns. Cool. Uh, thanks for thanks for sharing all those insights. Should we uh, should we go in any more details in specifically removing a database in case there's benefits to doing that? Uh, we do plan to deprecate all eventually, but it may still make sense maybe to keep uh, more than one, maybe two, in case we find that two of them kind of are like winners. That being said, uh, Jacob, I guess there's nothing to discuss about the blocks in performance PR. We just let you figure out what is to be done there. Okay. Uh, I need to read through the comments before I can agree, but in the meantime, I'll let Andy take over. But uh, thanks again, both, uh, yeah, uh, Jacob and Marco. And, ah, you say you're agreeing. Both. Okay, Andy, you wanna um, take over for the last point? Uh, the feedback, feedback and support. Uh, if you couldn't scroll down a little bit, please. I just wanna, yeah. Oop. I went too fat. Uh, a little bit up, right? Uh, so anyways, uh, just want to, uh, a few things. Um, um feedback uh is is we mentioned something uh last year this should take like maybe just a minute but uh we are trying to get more formal feedback from the teams we work on and also a general feedback from the community we want to be more open um and understand the ways that we work and what uh, works best I think this community calls are a good um, avenue to to gather feedback but we also want to give people, um avenues to provide that feedback even um um anonymously right so we'll have forms and things that people eventually will send out uh these links and people can uh provide this feedback in order so we understand and we can improve uh on the ways that we work uh with the community and our partners and, and users um, is there a form already thing, uh we we have a form uh so we we we'll probably be sending out uh, some of the forms. For some of the teams and things, we, we might also want to, uh, for people who want to, you know, provide feedback uh, that doesn't need to be anonymously, anonymously uh, we can reach out directly and we can have like a, maybe a 15, 20 minute session so we can we can get the, the feedback individually. Okay. Um, another thing is uh, we started out some work at, um, uh, late last year about talking uh, uh, some sort of uh, end of life support policy document. Uh, so we want to be more clear about our releases and when we would have some sort of end of life. Uh, this is not uh, very clear right now. And there are different levels of support that we'll be providing uh, based on the release. Uh, so we, we, we have this document that we've been working with some of the teams uh, that uh, to ensure that this is 
uh, something that is feasible and, and something that is fair. And, and we want to also eventually get some feedback uh, on that. Uh, once we have uh, more details, we'll also be sharing those. But it's just a, I I have, just saw uh -huh. a comment from Greg saying he loves the idea of long-term support. I do too. Um, the 34 series has this weird uh, <laughs> unkillability about it. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that as an LTS release, really. Yeah. Like, I, yeah I don't know what it is about 34, <laughs> but it just keeps going. Yeah, we, we we the idea with this is just like I said, be more transparent and 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 inform people about um, you know life cycles and things, so people can have a, a preparation and 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 to be fair, um, that they will have time to upgrade and move on. But I think it's important to be um, transparent about it, so people, you know don't delay things too much or, or things like that, right? So I think this is a good way. Uh, and again, once we have more details, we'll be sharing them with the community. Cool. I think we can still have, even without calling it LTS policy, uh, basically what the proposal is, and it's not really written here anywhere, the proposal is that there's gonna be custom, per version custom uh, end of life notices. So yeah, 34 could have an end of life notice of five years and V1 could have an end of life notice of one year, uh, which effectively makes 34 a LTS and V1 non-LTS. Uh, but that's not really, I don't think it's really described here. So I think we should probably get back to this discussion and like put the concrete proposal and uh, yeah, do the rounds with gathering feedback. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other topics on anyone's mind? Cool. Seems like there's nothing. Thanks again, uh, Erwan, Jacob, Marco, and the whole team. Yes, thanks, guys, for contributing to the meeting. Very happy. Yeah, thank you.